Um, I trust you've all enjoyed your luncheon. I trust you've all enjoyed this conference. It's just here that our Tucson friends and all their hard work has come to fruition. We're enjoying ourselves and we're working effortlessly. And now we come to one of the high points of our conference. Um, as a representative of the Board of Governors and the National Board of Directors of the National Space Society, I am very happy to introduce one of our featured speakers at this conference, a man whose writings have inspired a lot of our members in the field, and whose short biography you'll find in the program book, and whose words are much more important than my repeating them here, so I'd like to introduce uh, John Lewis. exceed those on Earth's surface by a factor of approximately 100 million. We'll have more to say about that. Okay, now, this is a sort of historical background. When, when people think in terms of moving into space, they think in terms of getting information from space, also called exploration, getting information relayed through space, also called communication, very profitable industry extraterrestrial scientific sample return. These are well-established ways of doing business. Next, a little more futuristic, we have energy sent from sources in space. That would be solar power, solar power satellites. Energy sources sent from space, most notably helium-3 from the moon or elsewhere. Rare and valuable minerals, those worth the transportation cost back to Earth, as most materials are it. Precious and strategic metals. There's a vast potential impact for those other three. But notice the geocentrism of this list. All of these things assume all your markets are on Earth. That isn't a necessary assumption. Uh, when we think about uh, the uh, European motivation for settling North America or the North American motivation for settling the West, of course they thought in terms of commodities would be returned to Amsterdam, to London, or to New York about profits that be made in the boardrooms in New York City. But look what happened. Virtually all of the resources generated by these expansion activities were eventually ended up being consumed in place by human presence. Okay? Here are some of the possible places we can go. 
for resources. And here's, this is basically a definition of what I mean by nearby space. Phobos and Deimos, which are highly accessible, it's much easier to land a payload on Phobos or Deimos and bring it back to Earth than it is to do it on Earth's moon. Much more accessible. Mars itself, which is uh, much more appropriate for one-way missions. It's tough to get off of Mars because of its gravity. The near-Earth asteroids and short-period comets, the ones that cross or graze Earth's orbit, are quite accessible to us. And then down here, the moon. moon with its various classes of accessible resources, including uh, minerals that provide oxygen, iron, and refractories, and, uh, and helium-3, and uh, this must be an old view graph that I dragged out of my files because it doesn't have the lunar polar ice in it, which I'll be mentioning later. And then space itself, if you're in space, you've got sunlight. So that's an important resource that we should be thinking about. Um, you'll notice throughout the table, Propellants figure mightily. Propellants are the key to getting where you want to go. They're the key to getting back to Earth. And the materials that make up propellants, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, are the materials of life support systems. So if you have found a likely source of propellants, you've also found a likely source of water for agriculture and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and so on for uh, use in building uh, independent biospheres, to coin a phrase. <laughs> Next, please. Um, here are the places where things will be in demand. We need to have not just a source of resources, we have to be able to deliver them someplace where they'll be useful. Well, where, where will things be in demand? Low Earth orbit. Propellants for transfer to geosynchronous orbit and beyond. They need life support fluids in low Earth orbit, called a space station. Structures. Shielding, any kind of material will do is shielding, I'll do for proton bombardment, water is about as good as shielding as you can find. In geosynchronous orbit, structure, shielding, propellants for station keeping, solar cell materials, silicon. At a lunar base, shielding, structures, metals, and hydrous cements, life support fluids, air, water, and nutrients, propellants for Earth return. Here we're getting into the uh, lunar polar ice. These materials would, in general, be used for local activities on the moon and for departure from the moon, not materials for export to other destinations. And likewise, in the Mars system, propellants would be first on your list of desirable materials. And you could imagine exporting propellants from Phobos and Demos. Exporting propellants from Mars doesn't make much sense because you're in the bottom of a deep gravity well and why pay the cost of getting out of that gravity well. Um, all right, so let's move along here. Um, what materials do we want? The materials we want ideally are those which are cheap and abundant in nature, not too hard to extract, and desired in high quantities. Anything that we just need a few ounces of, bring it with us. Anything that is enormously complex to manufacture, bring it with us. Integrated circuits initially will bring with you, okay? But there are some things that large-scale space activities demand in bulk and which are intrinsically cheap. We just have to be clever enough to find a source for them that's near the site of demand. Water, all the various uses of water listed. I, I'm going to be dashing through this talk. So I'm not reading every word. I will assume that many of you are literate, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> read this yourself. Ferrous native metals turn out to be very interesting because iron is very widespread in the solar system. On Earth, we have a mistaken idea about the means of access of iron and nickel and cobalt and so on. We are prejudiced by the fact that we live on a differentiated planet where these elements are sunk into the core. But they're actually much more abundant on the uh, surfaces of most asteroids than they are on the surface of the Earth. Iron, nickel, and cobalt for building structures and for making corrosion-resistant coatings, stainless steel, and the like. Platinum root metals for export to Earth because they have a very high intrinsic value. And then uh, the native iron that you find in meteorites. Uh, you know, when you go to a museum and you take a look at a piece of an iron meteorite, this is a piece of the Cicotaline iron from eastern Siberia. What you find in this is not just iron, cobalt, nickel, the main constituents of the metal, 
but dissolved platinum group metals with quantities up to 50 parts per million of materials that are worth typically $600 an ounce. And non-metals, including sulfur, phosphorus, nitrogen, chlorine, arsenic, gallium, germanium, indium, selenium, tellurium, the ideal materials for making semiconductors. Uh, and Jeff Cargill of the U.S. Geological Survey in Flagstaff has written a couple of papers, one of them on the economics of platinum group metal importation to Earth, and one of them on the uh, economics of uh, using those non-metals from non-terrestrial sources. Another thing that we generally need is shielding. Shielding could be almost anything, so why worry about it? If you have any kind of factory activities going on, and your raw, unprocessed feedstock, your dross, your, by, your processing byproducts, and whatever, could all be bagged and used as radiation shielding. So there's no problem here. But you need mass. You don't want to take that mass with you from the ground. It's the dumbest mass there is. So you don't want to have to pay thousands of dollars a pound to lift that dumb mass. Refractories for building chemical processing equipment, high temperature furnaces, rocket engines, ceramic rocket engines, and so on. Calcium, aluminum, and titanium oxides. And then carbonaceous material as a source of life support materials, chemical reagents, and propellants. Very much in demand. And energy. from my sponsor, the Space Engineering Research Center at the U of A, boasting about all the projects we've worked on in recent years. <laughs> we'll skip that. Okay. Go to the moon. You go to the moon and it's airless and it's waterless and you're standing on this dry, parched surface and you want to breathe. Take a hand of, handful of dust and inhale it. <laughs> One little pinch of dust about this big has enough oxygen in it to keep you alive for an hour. How easy is it to get? Yeah. 40% oxygen. 40% oxygen. But there's a little problem about breathing it. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go about getting from hand to nose? The answer is you have to chemically process it to extract the oxygen from some of the metals in it. The metals that are most easily uh, alienated from their oxygen are iron and iron. <laughs> Iron is the easiest to reduce. Silicon is a lot harder, and then many others are even harder than that. So uh, a mineral like iron titanate, ilmenite, can be treated with hydrogen gas brought from Earth, if you like. The hydrogen gas reacts with the ilmenite, breaks apart the iron oxide in it, takes out water, and leaves you with metallic iron and titanium dioxide. You then have a metal, a refractory, and water. You electrolyze the water using sunlight as the source of power, separate it into hydrogen and oxygen, and run the hydrogen back through with more ilmenite. So the hydrogen goes round and round, and the iron comes out here. Okay? So you have a, a mechanism for making three useful kinds of material with oxygen, metals, and refractors byproducts. All of these techniques and approximately 15 others have been proposed to carry out that same basic process. Reduction by hydrogen, electrolysis of molten silicates, plasma reduction, fluorination, chlorination, acid treatment, etc., etc. There's no shortage of bright ideas, several of which would probably work, <laughs> but we, we lack the research funds because we're dependent upon NASA's vision here. <laughs> Stop moaning. I have limited time, we don't have time for all the moaning that is appropriate. <laughs> uh, there's helium-3 on the moon. You, uh, Jerry Kolsinski has talked about this, and uh, uh, he says we go to the moon, we find solar wind implanted helium-3 in the regolith, we know it's there, we see it in our return lunar samples. We bake the regolith, drive out the helium and all the other gases, separate them chemically, separate them isotopically, and we end up with helium-3 to bring back to Earth. Helium-3 is a perfect fusion fuel used in combination with deuterium. It has the lowest amount of, of accidental or side production of neutrons, the highest production of energetic uh, charged species, charged nuclei, 
from which you can tap the energy uh, very efficiently. So it looks like a wonderful way to derive power. Has anyone ever built a fusion power reactor? I didn't say anything. Has anyone ever built a fusion power reactor fueled by deuterium and tritium? Excuse me, deuterium and tritium three. I want to keep away from tritium, both as a fuel and as a product because it's so radioactive. No. But when people are testing new fusion devices, they throw in a little deuterium and a little helium-3 and run it because it's not that hard to get it to fuse. And it doesn't induce radioactivity in the interior of the reactor on a large scale, which means if you have to go inside and diddle with it to adjust it, it doesn't cook you when you do it. So this is Jerry Kolsinski's energy bookkeeping for extracting helium-3 from the moon in gigajoules per kilogram of helium-3. That's a lot of energy to get it out, but the energy content of that helium-3 is astronomical, okay? That's the University of Wisconsin answer. My answer, doing the same arithmetic and uh, making what I think are much more realistic assumptions about the energy efficiency of making the uh, heat recovery from baked lunar dirt. Get a rather different answer. I get 85,264 instead of 6,364. Nonetheless, it would still be a positive energy payback. You get back at least a few times as much energy as it cost you to do it. And you've got to remember, a lot of that energy that you're putting in is just focused sunlight. It's not high energy that you cost you a lot of money. So there's a possibility that helium-3 could be made a going economic proposition. Um, and then, uh, um, I should mention at this point, the uh, uh, lunar polar ice. The lunar polar ice is in the worst possible location on the moon for accessibility. It's in permanent darkness. That's only the only reason it's there is because it's permanent darkness and cold. 100 degrees Kelvin at the poles in rugged terrain. But it's there. There's a lot of it there. The, the exact amount is not known. There is a crying need for exploratory missions to get into that area, down on the ground, prowl around, do drill cores, do geochemical sounding and well logging in these core holes, find out what's present. The vehicle that does that operates at 100 Kelvin in permanent darkness. This is demanding. Demanding translates into the English word expensive. <laughs> it also uh, uh, is hazardous in the sense that the probability of failure is fairly high. It's a risky business. Uh, risk aversive organizations, such as NASA, <laughs> are relatively unlikely to undertake such a task, despite its enormous economic promise in the long term. When you have to deal with Congress and budgets on a year-to-year -year basis, there is no long term. Okay. Uh, here we are, suddenly on Mars. One thing we can do on Mars, very simply, is inhale carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, crack it into CO and oxygen, use those as rocket propellants, liquid CO, liquid oxygen as rocket propellants for getting back off of Mars. A demonstration uh, experiment built by K.R. Sridhar from the University of Arizona will, will supposedly be flying to Mars on a mission yet to be re renamed, um, probably in a few short years, but who knows, uh, courtesy of NASA. Uh, there are other technologies, more modern technologies for CO2 cracking that I frankly think are superior to that one. This one has a relatively high risk of failure due to temperature stresses cracking the ceramic membrane in it. But there are more advanced technologies available that need to be pursued, and NASA has been unable to find a set of funding for these, including the molten carbonate process, which operates at a lower temperature than this with no thermal stress problems and uh, is simply a molten carbonate fuel cell run backwards. It's a technology upon which many tens of millions of dollars have been spent by companies building fuel cells. Extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere lets you make nitrogen tetroxide and also make ammonia or hydrazine as uh, storable rocket propellants. Using hydrogen transported from Earth can be used by means of the Sabatier process. Uh, uh, Zubrin's talked about this quite a bit to make methane or methanol or other relatively storable propellants. 
reacting nitrogen from the atmosphere with hydrogen, makes our ammonia and hydrazine that I mentioned earlier. But also, for those of you who are uh, aware of your own internal workings and care about them, amino acids and organic bases and so on. In other words, these are feedstocks for biological systems. They are nutrients. Finally, in, in order of increasing difficulty, using water extracted from the Martian atmosphere, polar caps, ground ice, and permafrost, all this was atmospheric processing. No mining, okay? no dirt to handle, no shoveling, no beneficiation. If you can actually go after the ice that's in the ground, then you can improve your, uh, your uh, overall system. Okay, now we move to one of my favorite locations, uh, well, this is, uh, we can skip this. This, this is some work that's done by Chris McKay at, uh, at uh, NASA Ames Research Center about various schemes for getting water on Mars. Uh, we'll have time to get into that now. So now we're moving on to the near-Earth asteroids. What is a near-Earth asteroid? Good question. The near-Earth asteroids are all those whose orbits cross or graze Earth's orbit around the sun. They all approach the sun within a distance of 1.3 astronomical units where the astronomical unit is defined as Earth's mean distance from the sun. So we're at one, plus or minus point oh four seven. Astronomical. Yeah. Astronomical. Anybody around here? I didn't hear anything. Astronomical unit. Astronomical unit. Yeah. AU. Okay. Factors governing the desirability of near Earth asteroid resources include the velocity requirement or energy requirement inbound from the asteroid point of view. So why do I start out inbound? Because this is the leg of the trip, this is the part of the mission where you're carrying the mass. Okay? So your performance on that leg of the mission or your, your performance requirements uh, have a very large effect on the overall feasibility of your, your mission. Second, the composition and mineralogy of the asteroid you land on. Asteroids are very diverse very different from each other. They belong to many different compositional classes. We have in our museums approximately 50 different kinds of meteorites which probably represent 50 different asteroids. There are lots of asteroids out there, probably many that we have never sampled. In fact, certainly many we've never sampled. So what you land on, if you land on a single crystal of iron that's 10 kilometers long, you don't want to be sitting there with a water sniffer trying to get some water out. It won't be very successful. On the other hand, if you land on, a, on an extinct comet core with a magnet to pick up the, the iron off the surface, you, you're going to be disappointed. You'll get magnetite, but you, it'll be the cruddiest magnetite you ever saw. So uh, you, you need to know where you're going. You need to have some preliminary data on what the compositions of these asteroids are and about the physical state of their surfaces as well as their chemical composition. You need to know what products are in demand where, and you have to find an asteroid that will be well suited to delivering that product to that destination. You need to understand the available processing technology. Much of this will be, you know, the very hottest 18th century ideas of extractive chemistry. Some of them will be late 19th century ideas, like the Mond carbonyl process for extracting ferrous metals, and some of them will even be 20th or 21st century processes. But you have to look widely here, and you're looking for simplicity and ease of automation. And then finally, you're looking at the delta V outbound to the asteroid from, say, the space station in the Earth orbit. All these factors have to be juggled to find an overall scenario that works. And we've done this for some missions. We found some missions where we go to asteroids that are made of carbonaceous, water-rich material, and we can return. Over, over the lifetime of the mission, 100 tons of water to the space station for every ton of payload we launch from Earth. Okay? So we've, we've looked at those logistics studies. We've, even finding one single example where you can get 100 to 1 payback suggests that this is something we need to do more carefully and more extensively. Okay. I'm going to describe the resources of the near-Earth asteroids in a rather strange way. So bear with me here. Let me explain what I'm doing. Suppose we have a fully recycling, a materials recycling economy, where all we consume is energy. So we bring in materials initially, get them into the system, and then we keep them cycling. And now, now we have to figure out how much iron do we have to have cycling in this system 
for each person to maintain that person with an adequate lifestyle. What's an adequate lifestyle? Western European, North American, Japanese levels of affluence. Okay? So how much iron do you need? How much nitrogen do you need? How much water do you need in the system? So we can, we can make this estimate. How much it requires to sustain one person for each of these various materials. And the per capita inventory right here is given in grams per person. And if you want to move the decimal point over six places, that's tons, metric tons, per person. That's about what you need. Then, uh, now let's take the known composition of the near Earth asteroid swarm and divide it through by the amount required to, to support a person. Tons of material, of each of these materials, divided by the number of tons per person. Tons divided by tons per person has units of? People. People, not person. People, that's correct. So this is the number of people who could be supported forever by having the near Earth asteroid swarm in circulation in a fully recycling environment where the only consumable is energy. 17 billion, 30 billion, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Numbers of order 10 billion people, comparable to the maximum carrying capacity of Earth's surface. When is the last time you read an editorial about resource shortages? Hmm? Or you heard about how we're running out of this and running out of that? The near Earth asteroid swarm <coughs> gives us a choice. <coughs> We either develop the technology to utilize these materials, which will support roughly 10 billion people from now until the time the sun dies, okay. or we can ignore them, in which case they will fall on our heads. <laughs> and you may call this divine retribution, or you may call it the natural consequence of stupidity. <laughs> There's not really much difference. Okay? What are the limiting factors? The limiting factors, the one that can only support 5 million people. Well, that's phosphates, but that's because we waste phosphates. We flush them down our rivers, into our lakes. We have you know, you know, eutrophication of our lakes because we waste our phosphates. What if we captured them? What if we took the runoff water from our, our agricultural modules and just ran it back through? Well, then that would decrease the usage of phosphates by at least a factor of 10, maybe a factor of 20, and this number would come up around 100. That's not the limiting factor. What about nitrogen? Oh, cement is irrelevant. Nitrogen is the next important limiting factor here. Nitrogen's a problem. Nitrogen is probably the limiting resource for human expansion in the solar system. Asteroids just don't have a lot of nitrogen in them. They have a few nitrogen atoms here and there in the organic gunk and the carbonaceous meteorites. Extinct comet cores have some nitrogen in them, but it's limiting. We need a lot of nitrogen to keep ourselves from burning up. So a lot of these early space stations, which have a nitrogen shortage, will be no smoking zones. I'm warning you this in advance. <laughs> okay. Next, please. Okay. So that gives you some idea of the magnitude of the resources available in the nearest swarm. This is where they are. At any given moment, the near-Earth asteroids are distributed like this. A typical near-Earth asteroid has an orbit that comes in close to the sun, cuts the orbits of several of the terrestrial planets, one, two, three, four of them, and goes out and loiters at aphelion out here between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter. Okay. So the typical near-Earth asteroid goes out here and comes in here and has an orbital period of three to seven years. When you look at all the asteroids, not just the near-Earth asteroids, but all the asteroids, you find that they exist mostly in a well-defined band, band around the sun. You don't see any gaps in that. There aren't any gaps in the distribution of asteroids around the sun. There are gaps in their orbital periods, but not in their distribution around the sun, distribution of distances. They're not in circular orbits, so there's no one-to-one -one correspondence so here's our, this is the asteroid belt out here. And then you'll notice there's a cloud of asteroids here and a cloud of asteroids here at the corners of an equilateral triangle with the Sun and Jupiter. And those are the Trojan and Greek asteroid swarms. The latest estimates are that the total mass of the Trojan and, asteroid, uh, the Trojan and Greek asteroid swarms is comparable to the total mass of the asteroid belt, maybe even larger. They're very, very dark. They're sooty, extremely black, hard to find, hard to see. Okay, let's, uh, 
Okay. Let's suppose we had, uh, let's suppose we put a cross it. No, it isn't. Surprise. Let's just see if you're awake. Uh, just to see, uh, suppose we, inst we install a processing plant on a near Earth asteroid, and it goes around the sun every few years. It passes through the asteroid belt and aphelion on each trip around the sun. Okay? So let's suppose we step off that asteroid at aphelion, and we fire a little rocket engine and match speeds with the asteroids out there in the belt. We have just transferred to the belt. We just made the propellant to do the transfer on the near Earth asteroid on the way out. Okay, we now step off, we're in the belt. Well, now we have roughly 40,000 kilometer or larger sized asteroids to choose from with enormous compositional diversity. We have a very good idea what the total composition of the belt is based on a combination of the study of meteorites and the reflection spectra of the asteroids matched against the reflection spectra of meteorites in the lab. We can identify minerals on other asteroids, and, uh, and not all of them, some of them are, some of them are weird, but most of them are well understood as familiar minerals in plausible proportions. So let's just add up the total content of all those materials, interpreting them in terms of their spectral analogs among the meteorites that fall on Earth. Here's the number of people you can support. I want to point out to you that that column there is in units of one billion people. <laughs> one billion people is a one. Billions and billions and billions. Millions and billions. Now, millions and billions is, 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 is paltry. This is millions of billions. We're talking here about a population that could be supported indefinitely until the sun gives up and stops pumping out energy, which is 10 million times the ultimate carrying capacity of planet Earth. Are we going to bring these resources back to Earth? Would that be, who would want 10 million times as many people living on Earth? No, of course not. We're not going to bring all this back to Earth. Will Earth get any of it? Only if they're good. <laughs> 10 billion times. Right. Suppose we took all the iron from the, the asteroid belt and brought it back to Earth and used it to build steel frame buildings. We could cover the surface of the Earth with a steel frame structure 80,000 feet high. There is not enough air on Earth to fill it. Okay. Let me move on. <laughs> You can tell I'm rapidly accelerating for it. It's too late. It's just too late. Oh, uh, skip this. This is getting helium-3 from Uranus and Neptune instead of getting it from the moon. Um, it, it's, it beats the, the lunar source by a factor of about 2,000 in terms of the amount of material, of material return per unit energy. <laughs> okay. These are some suggestions about what we can do in the near term regarding missions to near-Earth asteroids and to Phobos and Deimos, which are pretty much in the same category. Uh, we need Earth-based spectral characterization, uh, characterization of these new asteroids. The biggest problem we have right now is that the spectroscopists can't keep up with the discoverers. Uh, we need a dedicated, dedicated observatories to get us the spectra of these bodies as they're discovered. Um, there are synergistic science and engineering objectives for early near-Earth asteroid missions, the kind of measurements you need to characterize them scientifically, and those you need to treat them as resource targets are very similar to each other. We should get on with it. We should be doing these things. And we should be thinking in terms of extraction and retrieval on a kilogram scale of some materials from near-Earth asteroids using little experiments, extraction experiments that we're developing in our labs right now as a means of uh, testing our ideas about chemical processing in the asteroidal environment. Low specific impulse solar thermal and nuclear thermal propulsion systems appropriate for using water as a propellant are very simple, have very long expected lifetimes because you can operate them at low temperatures. Typical near-Earth asteroid mission has a low delta V requirement, a low velocity requirement, and Tsiolkovsky demonstrated algebraically back in, I think it was 1903, that for, uh, for, for energy limited missions, there was an optimum specific impulse. And that optimum specific impulse for a typical asteroid retrieval mission is down around 120 seconds. So you can operate your water 
boiler, your steam generator, cool, and uh, it'll last forever. Steam rockets, folks. <laughs> back to the steam engine, back to processing iron, back to the iron age. Okay. Water extraction enables massive sample return from bodies otherwise very hard to sample, including active short period pounds. Uh, and on the longer term, we can then talk in terms of industrial scale activities, bringing back hundreds wires, cables, plates, beams, fixtures, and so on in space, and even in their solar cells, possibly. They're relatively simple, once you know how to make them. Return of byproduct platinum group metals to Earth should be profitable, $400 million per ton. Not too bad. Economic studies of this have been done by Jeff Cardinal at the U.S. Geological Survey. So finally, last one, and then we'll set our clocks to 2 o'clock. <laughs> Critical technology demonstrations that are needed right now to make all this real. One, in situ propellant production on Mars. It's on order. It's scheduled. Second, water extraction from permafrost, phyllosilicates and hydrated salts. Mark Saunder and his team in, uh, in Adelaide, Australia, are working on this right now. We have a supporting proposal uh, coming from the University of Arizona to do some work on using dense carbon dioxide to extract water uh, to get water from all those different kinds of sources. This is in process. Microgravity electrolysis of water. It's uh, something that can easily be done aboard the space station or any other platform. Space station or getaway special. Demonstration. Uh, a, a demonstration could then be done on a near Earth asteroid to electrolyze the water and make and liquefy, uh, make and liquefy hydrogen and oxygen or propellants. And then demonstrating magnetic separation of native iron nickel from outer surface regolith material on asteroids on a near Earth asteroid and on the moon. There is metallic iron in the regolith of the moon. Not a lot, a factor of about 200 less than on a typical asteroid. And it is not lunar. Most of the, most of the metal in the regolith of the moon is asteroidal debris from asteroids that have hit the moon and blown themselves up and mixed themselves in with 100 times as much lunar dirt as they themselves have it. So these experiments are easy, relatively easy to design and execute, should be done early. Mond process, that's the gaseous carbonyl process, extraction and separation of metals, where you can grow crystals of iron nickel alloys at temperatures of 100 Celsius and a pressure of 10 atmospheres. You can essentially cast iron at the temperature of boiling water. Finally, fabrication of ferrous metals by a chemical vapor deposition, that's part and parcel of the same thing here, uh, decomposing the carbonyls to make products. So, bottom line, the technologies for making non-terrestrial resources available are in many cases already visible. They are in many cases developed in the lab. They have been developed in industry. They need to be adapted to microgravity conditions. And we have a very good idea how to do it. The main limiting factor. Dollars. Politics. Money. Money. It's politics only if it's a government endeavor. And I think it's only fair to tell you that uh, I don't have a great amount of faith in that approach. A world with government control of resource development is to me a dying world. It's following the path of the Soviet Union. Give, give us, in the space resource business, a world of competitive free enterprise resource development in space, and we will give you worlds without number to bring life to.